Okay, we're back. We're live. It's Monday morning. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. Hooray! And we're broadcasting from our 3.1 studio at Suite 603 in the Finance Factory Center downtown. We are so happy to be here. Thank you, Eric, for spending the weekend putting this thing together. Okay, anyway, today we have a show on architecture. We're calling it Think Tech Tech Talks, are we? Um, and that means we're going to talk about, make that community matters. Community matters. We're going to talk about architecture. We're going to talk about a new arrival uh, who is joining the faculty at the School of Architecture on University Avenue at UH Manoa. His name is Kevin Newts. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Jay. Um, I'm, I'm uh, honored to be your first guest. Uh, I hope, uh, I hope we, we set a new low level to uh, live down to here. <laughs> I warn you in advance, Kevin has a very sharp sense of humor, which is a good thing. We want that in I, all our architects. It, it is an acquired taste, Jay, that a lot of people never acquire. So uh, <laughs> I warn you now. So tell me, what, what is it? Why did you, this is my first question for you, Kevin. Why? Why did you come here to the land of Aloha, ostensible wow. Aloha? <laughs> uh, it, it is a long, uh, that is a long story. And I wish you told me that before. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Uh, to cut a long story short, uh, I suppose, Jay, um, I've been wanting to come here um, probably for the last 20 years. Uh, my research uh, relates uh, Japan and its uh, traditional architecture um, with contemporary um, non-Japanese society. So um, I wrote a book about Frank Lloyd Wright in Japan, for example, um, Oh, longer ago than I care to mention, but so I, even though I'm not from this part of the world, I've been looking at sort of trans-Pacific uh, relationships for, for most of my professional career. So this was an obvious place. It was the closest that I uh, could get to being in Japan um, without actually having to speak Japanese. I spent a lot of time in Japan. I taught there, um, did a lot of my research uh, in, in Tokyo. Um, then I spent um, uh, the best part of 20 years at the University of Oregon, which I thought was the closest I was ever going to get to um, Japan, and then an opening up um, opened up here at Manoa. So here I am, but this is the place that I've been trying to get to for a very long time. So. Well, congratulations on that, Kevin. Thank it you. was a worthy, it was, it was something out of the Bible, you know, you wait X, X number of years, and finally it happens. Good for you. So, um, you know, you, Frank Lloyd Wright had a presence in Japan, in Tokyo. As a matter of fact, my wife and I, on our last trip, we stayed at the Frank Lloyd Wright Hotel there in downtown Tokyo. I guess it was near the Ginza, I guess. Um, can you talk about that hotel? Well, uh, the hotel that you would have stayed at if this was in the last 40 years, Jay, um, <laughs> it's in the same location as, as Wright's old Imperial Hotel, but the the Imperial itself, the, the Frank Lloyd Wright building, sadly uh, was demolished in 1968. Um, so if you, there is a small exhibit in the lobby, um, but Wright's house, uh, Wright's uh, hotel was a, a much more modest three-story um, affair. Um, if you want to see the original lobby though, it is preserved in the Meiji Mura Museum over near Nagoya. So ah. yeah, that, that, um, that hotel, um, it was on such expensive land that in the end, and it was decaying, um, that they had to uh, demolish it, unfortunately. Not too bad. But Frank Lloyd Wright had a presence, I guess, in uh, Japan. Can you talk about that? Yeah, right. Um, it, it, he, for most of his early career, was under the influence of Louis Sullivan, the, the famous architect who helped to develop um, the high-rise office building in Chicago. And they were of the same opinion that uh, America, or at the end of the 19th century to stop copying the old world um, architecturally and look to develop its own unique architecture. Uh, so Wright uh, rejected, um, Daniel Burnham was the, was the big wheel in, in architectural circles at the time. Um, and he apparently, according to Wright, offered him a free all expenses paid trip around Europe. And Wright in his autobiography at least um, said that he rejected that. He said it was already too late. That, um, uh, but his first passport uh, took him to Japan, which was extremely unusual in 1905. So the irony is that in developing this new, quotes, American aesthetic, um, not entirely, but a significant 
portion of that actually came from another remote source from the opposite direction, uh, Japan, both, both building forms, not superficially, but also, and more importantly, a sort of philosophical attitude to the use of materials um, rather than direct copying of traditional Japanese built forms. With all of that, with your training in architecture in the UK and uh, your experience in, in, in Asia, not only Japan, but Hong Kong, wasn't it? Um, you've seen you've seen a lot. You've seen, uh, I don't want to say eclectic, but you've seen a lot of sources of design uh, and you put that together and then you arrive in Hawaii. So, you know, at Passover, the holiday in the spring, they always ask the question, why is this night different from all other nights? So, Kevin, I ask you your question. Why is this architect different from all other architects? What is the special sauce about you, Kevin? Uh, well, first of all, um, I wouldn't call myself an architect because um, I'm not licensed. Uh, I had a choice to, um, uh, to be licensed or to go off and do research. Uh, and it took me a nanosecond to decide that I could make a bigger contribution through research and teaching than, than in practice. Um, I would have been the world's worst practitioner, probably. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, we like I, to have uh, very classy guests on our show, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, knowing your limits, I think, is a gift, you know? Uh, so, um, I, you know, there are so many better people that, that practice out there than, than me um, who have the patience to, to deal with clients and, and all the other myriad of things. And I feel that my contribution, if I'm going to make one to architecture, is in you know, research and teaching, which is what I've been doing. Um, so, um, but in terms of what I do that's different, um, well, I wouldn't say it's uh, entirely unique, but uh, I, I have a particular take on, on Japan, I suppose, that I'm um, not your typical Japan scholar um, who, who are often interested in what is unique about that culture. Um, and it is in many respects unique and fascinating. And uh, I spent a lot of time, my, my daughter is half Japanese. I'm well connected to that culture, but I'll never be a Japanese, nor do I wish to be. And, um, and you know, don't get that me wrong. You know, it's just that culturally I'm, I'm still English and a little bit American, but uh, the, um, but I believe strongly that there are characteristics in Japan's traditional architecture in particular that transcend um, culture that go deeper. And I think that they understood some things about what it is to be a human being that, um, architects anywhere, uh, would do well to understand. Um, I, as a student of architecture, I used to bleat that, you know, the public knew nothing about architecture. And of course, um, it's completely the wrong way around that architects actually need to understand more about, or remember more about what it is to be a human being. So that's kind of, I think what I bring, um, that may be unusual is that I'm more interested in, in people and what, what unites us than in the things, you know, that, that obviously are important that, that make cultures and individuals unique, but I'm very interested in things that, um, um, transcend culture. So that's what I've been looking at for, um, in terms of the work on Japan and, and it actually, um, the work that I did most recently published most recently naturally animated architecture started in Japan, um, not intentionally, but that's where the first thread picked up. Uh, that was a culture that seemed to have a greater sensitivity, not unique, but it may be unique in degree, but not qualitatively in the natural environment. Um, it's a kind of cliche that that culture is, um, close to nature. Um, so I was, uh, inspired, uh, to write the most recent book, the naturally animated um, architecture, by examples that I was seeing around me in Japan, which I wasn't seeing elsewhere, and yet they resonated with me. And I thought, wow, this is something that everybody should be aware of. Um, it can't be just me. Um, so that's how, that's where I am today, uh, Jay, with uh, with the current work. Yeah. So, any is it like anime? Uh, uh, <laughs> well. Um, the, the only similarity would be uh, the word animation. And I, I hesitated to use that word because I thought it would be misunderstood. Uh, um, what I mean by animation is simply perceptible movement. Um, so um, our distant ancestors um, would have spent the vast majority of their lives outdoors uh, in, in a 
constantly changing natural environment. And as a result, they evolved to become dependent on contact with nature and particularly perceptible change to keep them alert. Um, and this is sort of a survival instinct. Um, and uh, we are physiologically, uh, some of us more than others, you know, 99.9% uh, .9 unchanged from, from our distant, you know, Stone Age ancestors. And yet, uh, according to the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, most Americans, for example, now spend well over 90% of their lives indoors. Um, and most indoor environments lack two critical characteristics uh, that we require for long-term well-being: contact with nature um, and perceptible change. And if you look around you, um, in most of the indoor environments that I use on a daily basis, then uh, there is no nature. Um, and uh, there's no natural change. Any change is, is going to be artificial. So that's what I've been looking at in Naturally Animated is to say, well, there's this problem, um, a lack of contact with nature. There's been plenty of research showing that we need that. that this is why we take hikes at the weekend. This is why we bring plants into our apartments and cats and fish and all those things. You know, yeah, yeah. this is the form of self-medication. <laughs> um, but I've been looking at um, a, a more available source then. Um, if, if, if many people are not in a position to just get up and take a walk or bring their dog to work or whatever it might be, um, what do we do for them? You know, um, could we possibly bring nature to them in a way that would not interfere with their um, ability to work? You know, if you're working in a factory for example, uh, or in office, you know, it may not be um, simple. Um, so I've been looking at uh, a source of, of contact with nature and perceptible change that's pretty much omnipresent, uh, the weather. And the great thing about the weather is, well, two things. It's a few millimeters away from us, the other side of a piece of glass, usually when we're indoors, if we're lucky enough to have a window. Um, and um, of course, it's famous because it is constantly changing. So it, in, in a nutshell, could solve or can solve um, those two um, deficiencies of most indoor spaces, lack of contact with nature and lack of perceptible change. Um, if we can find a way as designers to bring that natural change um, from the weather indoors. Oh, you raised so many questions on this. <laughs> but, but for example, I mean, yes, totally, I agree, I, I get it. Um, it's very valuable to connect with nature, and we do so little of that. I mean, in the olden days, a generation ago, people hiked every weekend. I don't, I don't think they do that so much anymore. They stay indoors, they study, they read, and they watch the animation of the TV. That's animated, right. but it's not exactly what you're talking about. So right. <clears throat> anyway, so windows and nature. <clears throat> but if I live uh, in the middle of a, of a, a crowded city, I see mm -hmm. uh, 40 foot concrete escarpments all around me. Uh, right. They're not animated and they're not nature and they're not, not even weather. So how do I right. see on the other side of that glass? How do I see nature rather than right. man's insult to nature? Absolutely. So, um, and it's that person in the sort of notional high rise, it's stuck in the middle of a open plan office that I have in mind um, uh, when, or had in mind when I was looking at this work. Um, I want to bring nature indoors. Um, so we can't control our view. You know, we, we, if you've got a great view, lucky you, but uh, most of us don't have control over our neighbors. And uh, um, so what I've been looking at is uh, trying to bring the movement of, of the weather, and particularly the sun, um, the wind and the rain uh, into indoor spaces. And there are three ways of doing that. One is, um, to enclose that, um, something that is being affected by, by one of those elements uh, in courtyards, which is fine if you're building um, a kind of low rise new build. Um, but for high rise, for example, the, the one that you just, uh, the example you um, just mentioned, then uh, a more practical method is to use projection of some kind. So sunlight can actually project um, movement uh, onto um, uh, translucent surfaces or into um, uh, a space through a window. 
So uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I think you can see it. There is a plant on my lanai. Um, if you don't have a lanai, there's, there are other ways of doing it, but that movement can actually be projected. If the sun comes around to that side of the building, the movement of those leaves, the wind generated movement of that palm will be projected so that it actually feels like it's indoors in this space with me. Mm -hmm. And we've been looking at uh, if you don't have another lanai, then can you put something on the exterior of a window, uh, like a screen that moves in the wind, that could be a safe replacement um, that would bring that natural movement of the wind effectively into a high rise space. Uh, clearly, a lot of office buildings don't have lanais and mm -hmm. it may not be practical to put planting out there, but there are things that you can do screening um, uh, that, that is, doesn't obstruct, obstruct the view, but uh, moves in the wind and will project shadows uh, and that movement into an indoor, uh, indoor space. You know, we, we talk about sustainability, resilience. We talk about climate change. We talk about extreme weather. We talk about wind or right at 90 miles an hour, that kind of wind. Yeah. And so yeah. how do you how do you do this? How do you expose the individual human being person um, to the weather and to the, you know, nature uh, and let it in on his life without letting uh, extreme weather in on his life? How do you do that? Yeah, um, it's, it's a great question because uh, you know, most architecture schools, are, you know, the first class you get is that architecture is shelter and shelter from what? Mostly the elements, you know, that um, too much sun, too much wind, too much rain, et cetera. So, um, you know, I've, I've spent the last sort of 10 years kind of undermining that, although <laughs> not, I, mean, I, I, I like to be, warm and dry, just like anybody else, you know, and not too hot. Um, so the, the key, uh, uh, Jay, is to maintain the envelope of the building, maintain the glass. Um, um, the, um, that envelope, um, uh, you know, in an extreme wind condition, for example, can um, stay closed. Now, there are situations where you might want to open that up, um, but you're not going to be naturally ventilating your apartment in a, in a hurricane, you know, so. Um, but most, the, the key thing for me is that um, not to interfere with the envelope of the building, to use remote projection. Uh, that sounds terribly sophisticated, but sunlight basically casting shadows in many cases or, or silhouettes onto translucent surfaces to um, bring that change uh, apparently indoors without actually um, uh, undermining the weatherproof envelope of a building. So it's a way of trying to have your cake and eat it too. Um, well, so I, I want to tell you a strange piece of, um, I don't know if it's architecture or just living circumstance. In the Hawaii Tourism Authority's convention center, there are a number of elevators and the right. elevators have nature scenes painted on them. But beyond mm. that, if you ride the elevator there, you hear just barely perceptible sounds of little birds birds chirping right. and cheeping. And you say, right. my God, where did that come from? I'm, it sounds like I'm in the forest. It's realistic. So I say to right. myself in the context of this conversation, why don't I use modern technology to create an environment inside which has right. the elements of outside? For example, I mean, you right. can buy now and in, at consumer prices, uh, some 82 inch television. And, yeah. and bigger, and you can put it yeah. on your wall and you can put a, yeah. a loop, and we're gonna talk yeah. about your loops in a minute. Uh, we put <laughs> a loop of, of forest scenes there, yeah. and then you can yeah. add the birds from the Hawaii yeah. Convention yeah. Center, and then you've got yeah. a pretty good emulation of what it's like to be in the forest. Now, this is not perfect. However, yeah. it's better than yeah. a 40 foot escarpment, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I, um, and there's been a lot of work on virtual environments. Uh, you know, it's a huge growing. I mean, uh, NASA, for example, has been promoting a lot of this because, you know, if it's true that we physiologically and psychologically need contact with nature and change, what do you do on a trip to Mars, for example? You know, uh, unless you're going to, you know, how are people going to not go crazy in that kind of uh, uh, sensorily deprived um, environment? You know, there's a reason why sensory deprivation is a form of torture because it is, you know. Uh, yes. So uh, what I'm arguing is that our buildings, or most of our indoor spaces, unintentionally subject us to a low level form of sensory deprivation, which is pretty appalling if you think about it. Nobody intended that, but it is a fact. So to come back to your question about, well, why don't we all do all of this virtually? 
you can and we actually tested it um, um, with an artificial digital tree uh, and we um, have that digital tree set up projected onto a an interior wall and in one instance it was being animated by real wind um, uh, from a sensor outside the building and in another case uh, it was being animated move uh, the leaves were being moved according to a mathematical algorithm and I was absolutely sure that that um, our subjects would be able to tell the difference that there'll be some magical thing um, that they would be able to sniff out the natural from the artificial I was shocked that they were completely unable to dif differentiate and this was not very sophisticated software so with the with the latest stuff you know, it's perfectly possible to fool the, the, the brain into thinking that it is natural. Here's the kicker, however. When we um, told them an untruth, we said that the natural one was artificial. Um, they're set, first of all, we showed them both and we asked them to assess them. No statistically um, significant difference in their evaluations. But then when we falsely told them that the natural one was created by an algorithm, their assessments dropped, right, went right through the floor. And then when we told them falsely um, that the artificial one was natural, their evaluations went up significantly. So in other words, the mere perception that something is natural or artificial affects its impact on us psychologically. Yeah. So I had an accountant one time and I asked him what he practiced. And he said he practiced psychiatric accounting. <laughs> so I, I said, what? <laughs> He says, well, you know, there's a lot to do with between psychology and, and, and accounting. Yeah. And, and, and I'm wondering, I wanted my next question, Kevin, was going to be, what are you teaching? Um, and yep. the answer might be in part, you know, psychiatric architecture. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably. Um, I, 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 I prefer uh, to call it experiential. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I teach what I'm asked to teach. Uh, I teach a lot of uh, history theory, um, but I also teach design, and uh, and even in in the courses that, um, uh, on theory, um, I, experience human experience is is, is a big deal. Um, it, it, every building, I, I like to say, uh, ends with somebody walking through a building and experiencing it. So why wouldn't you begin designing it that way? Why would you begin with a plan when nobody ever experiences a building that way? You know, they experience it from their body moving through space, you know. So I encourage students to, and it's not easy, to try to envisage how it's going to be, how they want it to be. Now, they're never going to perfectly get that, but a lot of buildings never go through that stage. And then it's no surprise when they're not great experiences because they were never envisaged as an experience to start with. So, um, yeah, if you want to call it psychological, but I, I call it experiential. <laughs> you know, it's, so it's societal too. You know, what, what yeah. turned me on to the notion of public spaces was a talk on C-SPAN by a guy right. named Michael Kimmelman, who was the architectural right. critic for the New York Times. And mm -hmm. he gave a talk at Yale uh, explaining, and I really hadn't, I hadn't understood this before, is that the, the health, the nature, the, the characteristics of a society in general depend in large part on public spaces because it's right. an interaction, just as an interaction with government, it's interaction with, you know, the physical aspect of the community. Uh, where does that fit into your special sauce? Uh, well, I'm dealing with indoor spaces mostly, um, although they can be public. Uh, you know, uh, large buildings have, um, you know, you talk about the convention center. I'm, I'm literally to my right, uh, a couple of hundred yards away from the convention center. I was going to joke that the bird song you could hear, they're, they're, those are the same Java finches that bother me on my <laughs> They're real. Of course. Uh, they, they're in my apartment. I mean, if I had the windows open, they'd be in the backdrop to this shot, honestly. Yeah. Um, but um, so there are um, public spaces inside buildings. So my, I feel that uh, outdoor spaces, um, by and large, can take care of themselves in, ter in the narrow confines of what I've been talking about, natural change, etc. The weather is going to make itself felt in those places, whether we want it to or not. So I don't feel that they're, in terms of sensory deprivation, um, they can be improved. Obviously, you often have, um, you know, fountains and, and other elements uh, in those spaces. And there are, there, there are certainly ways that you can make them more engaging. But the place that I feel that we are seriously deprived uh, is, is those indoor spaces. So mm. if I, haven't, I haven't 
um, actually got into the convention center yet, but I'm told that it is cavernous, absolutely enormous. And I'm curious about whether it's, um, it's indoor spaces, you know, really do um, activate, uh, you know, is nature in there? Because um, going back to your first question, you know, why am I here? I felt, um, well, I got confirmation in the first couple of days, you know, I saw like five rainbows and I thought, wow, this is a place where it rains, is sunny um, and windy uh, within, uh, you know, two minutes, uh, it can change from one to the other or one block. So this place, this environment is an incredible environment for the sort of thing that I'm talking about. Yeah, it's, it's a perfect, very perfect connection. It, now we, we, really, you know, we only have a few minutes left, Kevin, and I do want yeah. to show uh, one last video we haven't shown. Can you talk about what that is and then we'll show it? Yeah. Um, so this is a sort of compilation, a little abstract from the book, Naturally Animated Architecture, which came out in uh, 2008, uh, sorry, 2018. Uh, uh, it's both, um, a, um, a, a, an ebook and a, and a, a printed book. Um, the key thing is that it is a, um, uh, it contains embedded video. Um, you're just starting to see, um, mm -hmm. examples then embedded within the pages of the book, both the ebook and you can, on the physical book, you can, uh, download an app to, to play the videos on a, on a smartphone. And, and this was kind of pretty new a, a couple of years ago, um, the combination of, um, uh, of embedded video in the page of a book. Yeah. And these give you some examples of the kind of thing then where the envelope of the building is being maintained. But look at the example we're showing now. These are, these are caustics. You'd see them on the underside of building, or underside of bridges and boats most often. Uh -huh. But if you set it upright with a, a surface of water outside a window, you can actually get the wind movement projected into an interior space. So this is what I mean by having a cake and eating it, not uh, undermining the envelope of the building, um, but bringing um, the change of the wind, the sun, the rain effectively indoors without actually necessarily bringing the wind or the rain directly indoors. The example we're looking at is a 500 year example from, um, uh, from Kyoto where um, they're actually using um, uh, exposing rainwater. Um, and it, one of the things we've not mentioned, Jay, that, that I should is that sunlight, wind and rain are the three prime suspects in passive environmental control for buildings, indoor passive environmental mm -hmm. control. It's a way of saving energy and saving the planet. So um, this book deals with both how to improve human being in indoor, in, indoor spaces, but also how to draw attention to things like natural ventilation, um, passive solar heating, um, natural daylighting, um, uh, evaporative cooling and rainwater harvesting, which uh, are known as passive because they don't have moving parts typically. And that's one of the reasons that they don't get much public attention that a lot of these lead buildings, um, lead is one of the sustainable um, kind of hallmarks. You'll see it sometimes if you look, you'll see a plaque inside a building but that's the only evidence that you see. And most members of the public, why would they know? The building really doesn't speak. It doesn't say what it's doing. And I feel very strongly that everybody uses buildings. Everybody, um, you know, works in a building typically or interacts. And yet they are being woefully underused as teachers. Things that could actually speak for themselves, start a conversation. Somebody says, what is that strange effect? What's that, what's that about? It's neat. But that could be the beginning, I hope, of a serious conversation about, well, that's actually saving energy because it means that there's more daylight in here. We don't have to turn the lights on. You know, that means we're actually saving the planet. Um, so there's a serious side to this, apart from the sort of cool effects, um, human psychology and, um, and the planet. Yeah. Kevin, Kevin Newts, uh, creativity, animated creativity at UH School of Architecture, making it yet to a greater extent, a, a, a global school of architecture, a global school of creativity. Thank you so much, Kevin. Great to meet you. Great to have you on the show. Uh, I want to do it again. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jay. Thanks for having me. Goodbye. Al Aloha.
Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, the host of Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Hawaii Together deals with the problems we face in paradise and looks for solutions, whether it's with the economy, the government, or society. We're streamed live on Think Tech bi-weekly at 2 p.m. on Mondays. I want to thank you so much for watching. We look forward to seeing you. Again, I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Being a lawyer has many aspects, and I try to cover them every time I do a program of Law Across the Sea. Not everything has to do with law or being a lawyer per se. Some of it has to do with the people you meet, the things you see, the places you visit. And that's what I try to combine in Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Thank you for watching. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Lillian Kumi, host of Lillian's Vegan World, the show where we talk about veganism and the plant-based diet located in Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm a vegan chef and cooking instructor, and I have lots of uh, information to share with you about how awesome this plant-based diet is. So do tune in every second Thursday from 1 p.m. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Christine Linders, a physical therapy specialist and the host of Movement Matters. My show is designed to teach you the simplest and most effective treatment strategies to get you out of pain and back to doing what you love. If you or someone you know is having pain in a certain area of the body and would like a free assessment in treatment over media or in person, and then come on the show to talk about it, email us at thinktechmovementmatters at gmail.com. Or if you have a topic you would like to know more about, please email us. My goal is to decrease pain all over the world, inspiring people to take better care of their bodies, to enjoy life to the fullest. I look forward to hearing from you. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. You know, we are very concerned about the coronavirus. Uh, it's expanding in geographical terms and, and it's very threatening to uh, the places to which it expands and to humanity in general. It is, uh, it is traveling around the world. We're doing a number of shows on it. We think it's that important. Uh, from one end to the other, we're talking to people in various countries and various disciplines, including, of course, medical disciplines and um, infectious diseases uh, disciplines. Uh, because we want the public to understand, not panic, but understand what's going on and what will go on. This is a dynamic uh, event, and it's going to change. It's going to change this spring, and it's going to change after that, too. Uh, one of the things uh, that we're doing is uh, a show with Sarah Park, Dr. Sarah Park. She is in infectious diseases uh, at the Department of Health under Bruce Anderson, the Director of Health. And she's going to come on the show uh, on, on Friday, and she's going to talk about uh, what it means for the state of Hawaii, how far uh, we've gone with it, how many infections we might have or will have, and uh, we're going to learn a lot. We'll learn a lot in the future with other shows, too. In the meantime, uh, this came to my attention uh, yesterday, and it's worth playing for you just to show the level of concern, uh, if, not, if not rational, then irrational, in Hong Kong where people are lining up uh, around the block, you'll see what I mean, um, to get uh, masks, some of which uh, may not be effective uh, in Hong Kong. So here, take a look at this video and see what's happening in Hong Kong. And the same kind of thing is happening in other places in Asia. Okay, take a look. <laughs> 